<clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the Whitney uh, Evenings at Whitney Lecture Series here on uh, Thursdays. Uh, I think some of you saw that we were having another interesting talk next week. It's, uh, I mean, not next week, it's in three weeks. Uh, Bob Goldstein is going to be talking about a really interesting group of animals called tardigrades or the water bears. And um, I think uh, you'll find that that's quite interesting. Uh, but today, I get a, it's my pleasure to introduce Alana O'Reilly, who's here from the Fox Chase Cancer Institute in Philadelphia. And let's see, she um, grew up in New Jersey. I have to go through the whole litany. Uh, went, uh, was an English major at the University of Pennsylvania, transferred to graduate school at Harvard, uh, where she became interested in cancer cell biology there, working on vertebrates. And then um, she went to Stanford, out to California, to learn Drosophila genetic, uh, genetics, fly genetics. And then um, she took her job at the uh, Cancer Institute in Philadelphia. And I met Alana maybe th four months ago or six months ago or something like that. And we were at an NIH study section panel reviewing grants, which is a horrible job. And, um, and the one thing that we started talking about was that, that we both run outreach programs and neither one of us can get funding to, 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 to actually host them. And um, so this initiated a nice dialogue about different uh, approaches and uh, ways and mechanisms, ages, and strategies to sort of try to get um, kids interested in science and stay in science and initiate this sort of lifelong learning process that we all sort of strive, uh, strive for. So um, Alana is going to be here for today and tomorrow. She's going to give us a research seminar upstairs, um, like most of our speakers do, on her uh, research topic. But tonight she's going to tell you a little bit more about how she's been able to sort of leverage her research interests uh, into uh, an outreach and education program um, for high school students. And it's been a natural journey for her, I think, because um, her research uh, interests are related to a certain kind of signaling pathway that is very sensitive to diet. And I think this has really sort of helped close the circle to understanding how diet in general is um, important for uh, normal health and disease. So without any further ado, I will have Alana up here and let her take over the show, okay? <laughs> well, thanks for coming. I know you guys are usually used to marine organisms and stuff, and this is, I hear, the first cancer talk that you've had here. And what the most important thing about cancer is, is that it's basically a developmental disease. And so one of the things that we're most interested in is understanding how the developmental processes work and then applying them to cancer. And so our... Um, our main interest now, which has kind of come around a couple times, is what, it, what is the meaning of a healthy, balanced diet? And so we have this brand new um, depiction basically telling you what a healthy diet is based on the size of a plate. So you have your breads, lots of vegetables, take up about two-thirds of your diet, supposedly. Um, then you have meat and alternatives, dairy products, and then here's the junk food section. Um, so, so basically, whenever you plan your plate, you're supposed to plan it this way, so that two-thirds is breads and vegetables, and then another third is everything else. But what does this actually mean? Why, are, why is this designated as a healthy diet? Does anyone actually really know? So we're going to do a little quiz. Class participation. Okay, ready? Is this healthy or not healthy? Healthy. Good. Healthy or not healthy? Not healthy. How about eggs? Healthy? Everyone? Hands? Everyone. Okay. Both, right? So in the yolk of eggs, you have all of these absolutely essential vitamins and minerals that your body needs to function. But at the same time, the high cholesterol in egg yolks, for most people with heart disease, high blood pressure, um, any kind of condition that can be influenced by high cholesterol is very bad food for them to eat. So, so this is sort of the first indication um, that there are foods that have positive things and negative things, right? So how do you make this choice on that plate? It gets harder. How about licorice? Healthy? Not healthy. Not a lot of votes this time. Everybody knows the trick, right? Yeah. So licorice has this um, chemical compound in it that has been used for tens of thousands of years as a natural medicine treatment for a lot of things, especially stomach disorders, chest con congestion, and these sorts of things. Um, the not healthy part is that 
If you eat a lot of licorice, you will dramatically increase your blood pressure in a dangerous way. Um, it also changes steroid hormone levels, which increases estrogen and reduces testosterone, which can have obvious um, effects on human health. So even something that you know, seems like candy can actually have healthy and not healthy um, benefits. Okay, we're in Florida, right? <laughs> healthy? Oh, we have a maybe, okay. Okay, it's healthy in general. Um, so you, vitamin C is absolutely essential that you have to get it from your diet. Your body cannot produce vitamin C on its own. So you need it for all of these various processes in your body. When is a situation where it might be not healthy? Diabetes. Okay, and one of the things that Fox Chase that we worry about is it can directly counteract chemotherapy. So we don't want people taking vitamin C when they're actively taking chemotherapy because it will reduce the effects of the chemotherapy, um, and that's obviously not, not a good thing. But otherwise, it's healthy, so keep eating. Oh, it, it can also promote um, kidney stones, sorry. Okay. Which? We have red and white, right? Red wine, healthy? Yes. Okay. So people keep saying red wine is healthy because of this compound called resveratrol. Um, it's also not healthy because alcohol is uh, counterindicated for most human health conditions. Um, so again, balance is the key. And resveratrol is a very interesting compound um, because it can actually extend normal lifespan in small organisms. So um, in, in yeast in particular, it almost doubles the lifespan of a yeast. Flies, the effect is a bit more modest. Um, but this is a marine organism, right? <laughs> yeah, killfish. Freshwater. Freshwater, marine. That's not marine, okay. Um, anyway, it extends the lifespan. So, so people say that resveratrol is um, healthy for, for healthy aging. So now we're back to this. So we now have heard about a whole bunch of foods that are healthy, not healthy, and the reason they're healthy or not healthy is because of the individual chemicals that comprise them. So how do we figure this out? How do we know how to choose our foods? We can do it by this plate thing, but what's inside of an orange, and is that something I should be eating today if I'm taking chemotherapy? So, um, so what we're really aiming to understand is what the chemicals inside the foods do so that people can have a much more specific way of... Um, deciding what their diet should do, especially given specific personal health conditions. And so we all know that a healthy diet, you have to have enough protein, sugar, vitamins and minerals, and lipids in order to um, function. But, but what do all of these things do? And so the way this is decided um, in terms of the, so these are called, they used to be um, recommended daily allowances, now they're called dietary reference intake, because that means nothing to most people. Um, so, so the way they do this is they basically decide first what an estimated average requirement is. This was initially started in the military for men approximately 180 pounds, um, 5 foot 10-ish. And so originally when this first started um, in World War II, the, the estimated average requirement was based on them. Now they do it for a number of ages that I'll get to in a second. So this is the amount of daily requirement um, that keeps 50% of the people in a given category healthy. So then they take the recommended daily allowance, which is a little more than that. There's a math formula um, that they use for this. And then you have an upper tolerable limit, which is if you eat more than this, it's going to give you uh, another adverse effect. So the, the life stages are separated. And this is, I think this is interesting. So infants um, are separated into two halves all within the, the first 12 months. Then you have toddlers, early childhood, adolescence, which includes nine all the way through 18, which I think has um, vastly different dietary requirements. Then young adult and middle age, and then some of us here are still waiting to become adults. So, <laughs> um, so you're not an adult until you're over 50. And so the, when you look at recommended daily allowances, make sure you, you um, categorize itself for your own age group, so um, because the these numbers and the formulas are actually different. Okay, so how did we get into this? My lab was interested in eggs. Um, so we knew ahead of time that uh, a poor diet can actually result in very poor eggs. So these are chicken eggs. This is a healthy, 
a, a egg from a chicken that eats a healthy diet, and this is an egg from a chicken that has a, a poor diet actually lacking in cholesterol, and you can see that it's all wrinkly and um, would not be fertile. And so we were interested in this in fruit flies, um, where their, their ovaries are extremely robust and large with the opaque white eggs um, here at the posterior end when they're fed a healthy diet, within 24 hours, just 24 hours of being switched to a poor diet, the eggs are gone and the stem cells stop dividing and the uh, flies stop producing eggs. So this was the process that I started my lab with, not really focused on diet, but just on understanding um, how egg production works in flies. So why would we use flies? Um, you guys are already convinced that organisms are interesting, biology is interesting. At a cancer center, that's not the easiest sell. Um, so I always have to tell them why, why are flies relevant to humans. And so this is one example of a developmental um, signal transduction pathway called hedgehog, um, which is important both in development of flies and in humans. And so this is a, a normal fly in, a, in the maggot larval stage here. And you can see these beautiful um, black denticle bands that, that separate the segments that will eventually become all of the different segments of the adult fly. In the hedgehog mutant, these are all condensed together, so it looks like just a big scribble. And the people who identified it thought it looked like a baby hedgehog, and so hence the name. Um, so in humans, there are several different um, abnormalities that come from defective hedgehog signaling. This is actually prehistorical rock art where um, the, the footprints here have six toes. And so one of the things hedgehog does is control limb development, including this is a baby with eight toes and a cat um, with six toes. So that's one of the things hedgehog does. It also controls brain development and is very important for that. And one thing that we can do in flies is actually measure um, directly the effects of changing hedgehog signaling on specific cells. So this is the stem cell compartment of the fly ovary here, and we can measure how the stem cells work by, by um, counting the number of cells that they produce. And so this is related to cancer because pancreatic basal cell carcinoma and medulloblastoma are specifically induced by changes in the hedgehog signaling pathway. And so the link is we can understand how too much cell division happens in the fly in relationship to hedgehog signaling and then correlate that later on to the, to the cancer mechanisms. Okay, so this is the, a cartoon version of what I just showed you, the stem cell compartment of the fly ovary. It has a germline stem cell, which um, eventually goes on to produce the fly egg. And the germline stem cell is controlled by the green cells here that send all the signals to maintain it in a stem cell state. I usually say the um, disclaimer that these types of stem cells are adult stem cells, they're not the embryonic stem cells that are quite politically charged sometimes. Um, so, so all of us have these adult stem cells in pretty much all tissues of our body that function well after we have been born. Um, so, so these adult stem cells are the main focus for my lab. So hedgehog is produced by these cells that control the stem cells and maintain them as stem cells for a long time, and it gets released and lands on a second stem cell population, shown here in red, that produces these beautiful yellow cells that surround each of the developing eggs. And these cells are necessary eventually to become the egg shell that uh, forms around the egg. So the way the hedgehog um, pathway works is when hedgehog is not there, there's a series of proteins called patched and smoothened, um, where patched keeps smoothened turned off. And so the cell's not doing anything, it's just sitting there. Um, when hedgehog is made, it gets released, it binds to patch, and then it allows smoothen to be active. When smoothen is active, it turns on transcription of genes um, that drive the, the division of the cell, the cell proliferation. And so this was known uh, really before we, started, um, before we started this project. So what we found, we wanted to understand how this whole process works, and we, genetically we identified a protein called BOI, which is shown here. It's a protein that directly holds on to that hedgehog molecule and controls whether it can get released or, or held to the cell where it's produced. And when we used um, antibodies to show where this boy protein is actually located, it's located on those cells that actually control the stem cells. Um, and it's there together with, with hedgehog itself. 
So in flies, we have this handy, flies are genetic organisms, so you can basically take genes away, put genes in, manipulate gene expression really on a cell-to-cell -cell basis. And so we took this boy protein that holds on to the hedgehog away and saw a very dramatic change in the hedgehog. So now we have no green, so the boy is gone, the flies have no boy protein, and the hedgehog is now released and accumulates right where the stem cells are. So what ends up happening is the stem cells keep dividing, 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 because nothing is holding the ligand from, um, from stimulating them to divide. And so they divide at approximately fourfold higher rates than wild type. And what we get is what we saw before, which is accumulation of too many, um, too many cells in between, the developing, in between the developing eggs. So this is a really interesting phenomenon that people hadn't seen before, where the protein actually hangs on to this growth factor that drives proliferation Oops, that we, that we know is super important for, for um, cancer cells. So why would you do it this way? There's so many ways of controlling these sorts of signaling pathways. And we thought about this and thought about this and finally came back to this idea that I started with here, which is that when you um, feed flies, they have really robust egg production. And with only 24 hours of stopping feeding them, the eggs are gone. So maybe the whole reason why you would hold on to hedgehog and then let it go is because you need to have a rapid response to feeding. And so humans don't really need that, we ha especially here, we have access to food all the time. But think if you're a fruit fly, you're flying around, some hummingbird eats you, <laughs> you better have laid your eggs already. And so flies have to have an extremely rapid response time to get those eggs in a place where there's a food source for them to actually develop. Um, so we thought we'd try and see if we put the flies on poor food for a few days and then fed them their favorite food, which is yeast, would we see this change? So would they go from, from being held um, where the growth factor is made into release to drive the stem cell proliferation? And that's what we ended up seeing. So here is a, a stem cell compartment from a starved fly. And you can see here the hedgehog is now in green and it's held on to the cells that make it. And it is not accumulated around the red dots where the stem cells are. In just 15 minutes, 15 minutes, which is so fast after they've eaten, all of the hedgehog is released. By three to six hours, you can see that it accumulates specifically and robustly inside the stem cell, where it then drives, um, drives the stem cell to divide. So we know that this isn't because the boy protein is lost from expression, because we can still see it when they're starved or fed. Um, and this correlates, so this is really like an amazing correlation between the amount of the hedgehog that accumulates in the stem cells and the rate of proliferation of those cells. This is a very, very, very specific response to feeding. That was actually a big surprise um, to us and a lot of other people. So most stem cells are controlled by insulin signaling, and so we thought that would be obviously the way it works. And so again, flies' favorite food is yeast, so imagine that dinner plate, but for a fly, it's just yeast. <laughs> um, it has everything that they need, including all of the stuff we talked about before. So we wanted to just prove that it was insulin signaling. So what we did was we used yeast extract, which has all the components of yeast, but without the lipids. And we figured we would just get the same response and then start to fractionate the, the yeast extract to figure out exactly which component of the yeast was stimulating this response. And we got another big surprise. So here we have the hedgehog held on in the starved flies, as we expected. It's um, accumulating in the stem cells here when we feed them yeast. But when we feed them yeast extract, nothing happens. It doesn't work. And so all of these protein sugars, um, and some of the vitamins can actually trigger insulin signaling, but this was not sufficient to actually um, drive the hedgehog signal. So these are the, this is just the quantitation of this assay. And then we also took the insulin receptor away, the protein that actually tells the cell, okay, we're gonna respond to insulin now, and there is no difference at all um, in that. So this led us to conclude it's not insulin, and we had to scratch our heads and think, and think what could it possibly be? So what's left, right? The only thing we took away was the lipids. So it must be one of those. And just like vitamin C is necessary to be acquired from the diet for humans, you have to acquire, a fly has to acquire cholesterol from the diet. Unlike humans, they can't make their own. So we decided to first test to see whether cholesterol was the key molecule here. And here again, you see it, it's um, held on in the starved. 
it accumulates in the stem cell in the fed full yeast. And then if we added cholesterol to our yeast extract, then we rescued the phenotype back to normal. So cholesterol was the, was the key molecule in the yeast that was actually stimulating this um, signaling process. So, so this is kind of a, a, an amazingly eye-opening thing um, where you, you have a bunch of food, right? Like the fly is eating all the food that it needs, but only uh, it's, we actually went on and um, mapped all of the specific proteins that get touched by this um, whole pathway to make the response happen. But basically you have a whole bunch of food and you have one specific component of that food that turns on this amazing signaling pathway that then drives the, and controls a specific stem cell population. Um, so this is a systemic response that leads to a, a local activation of a signaling pathway that ends up having a, a, a highly specific and important response in a specific target cell. And so the postdoc who did this work, Tiff Hartman, now has her own lab, and she is investigating the same process in pancreatic cancer where the hedgehog pathway is also important. And what she sees in, in red here is the, the human version of that boy protein that holds on to the hedgehog, and in green is the hedgehog protein. And so the cells here in the middle are the tumor cells. Um, and the cells around it that don't have the hedgehog are the, the normal cells. And so she's in the process now of figuring out whether this um, cholesterol response is important for the development and growth of pancreatic tumors. And so far what she finds is that if you feed these cancer cells cholesterol, they do the same thing. They release the hedgehog um, to drive the proliferation of the cells. So that's going to be an ongoing story. Okay, so what we've done now is we've found a signal component of the diet that turns on this protein, then this protein, alters this protein, and then the hedgehog gets released to, to make a, a biological process. And so it's sort of like, like a Rube Goldberg machine. So if we do this with the Rube Goldberg, so, so this is cholesterol. The fly's eating. And it triggers all this huge response pathway of molecular events that occur inside of the cell. Right? There's a whole bunch of steps in order to get this, this um, outcome that you want to have. Okay, so now we're releasing the hedgehog. That turns on the stem cells. Okay? So, so this took, us, this took us seven years to figure this out, and um, it's two different publications with, I think it was 14 authors altogether. So what are we going to do when we have a situation where we want to know what every component of the diet does? So now we have a much more complex machine. Each marble, imagine, is one component of the food you just ate. They accumulate, they have to know where to go. in order to create this music that's inside of you that to make all of your organs function. And it starts out simple in this case, and I'm not going to play the, the whole thing. I can play it for you later. It's really cool. It's on YouTube. Um, right? So now it gets more complicated. Now other cells are becoming involved. I just want to wait till it gets... It, this thing is crazy. It gets really... Right? So now your whole organ is functioning. So how are we going to figure this out? How are we going to how are we going to determine what all of these different marbles do in a in a time and space fashion so that we can really tell everybody what is a balanced diet? So again, we have our balanced diet. Um, the idea is that it maintains cells, organs, tissues, and an organism in a balanced state. Where if you have any um, ups or downs in important things, then you can end up inducing um, cancer, which we don't want to do. So, so now we go back to our healthy food, the grapes. So everybody thinks grapes are healthy. Why are they healthy? Um, they have a lot of sugar in them and they have all of these other 57 different chemicals inside them that we don't really know what they do inside of the body. So the only, like I said, it was primarily one person, one postdoc who did most of the other work with the help of 13 additional people in seven years. 
So how are we going to even just start with a one grape and figure all this out? So what we decided to do is build an army of people, um, specifically high school students, to actually investigate all of the different components of a diet. And so we've trained now 70, um, 76 students since 2013 in real, genuine, bona fide um, cancer research. They are selected by a written application process that's blind, so we don't know their gender, um, race, schools, income, nothing. We know nothing about them except what they told us about their interest in science. Um, then they come to the lab and they actually perform really cutting-edge cancer research on how these dietary components uh, function inside of flies. So the program has expanded rapidly <laughs> since 2013. We started out with just a, a big sort of 250 kids um, symposium where they come and experience all of the different things that you can, um, different jobs you can do at a cancer center. And then the second thing we did was to have this research course that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk after this. Um, we brought in high school teachers because we really weren't getting the underserved students in the Philadelphia Public School District to come to us. So we decided to go to them by training their teachers. And now we have a mobile laboratory in a box that the teachers can take, basically sign out like a library, and they can do all of the experiments that we do in the Fox Chase Lab in their, in their home classrooms. Um, and then we kept expanding more and more. So just this year, I started doing a program at my kids' school um, in first and third grades to train them how to use biomedical uh, laboratory research tools and so that they will know that you know, the book learning is linked to something that will, they will get later. Um, and just this year, in two weeks, we're starting our very first experiment where an entire school has integrated the, this immersion science program um, to actually generate data for a publication that we're planning to submit for um, review in the summer. So how do we do this? It seems impossible that 16, 17, 18-year-old kids can do real cancer research. So what we did was um, collected dietary supplements, because we had no funding. Um, so we went to the health food store. The ones we selected initially, we made a rule that it had to be less than $8 <laughs> for the bottle. Um, we've expanded that now, um, mostly from my own personal funds, uh, just things that the kids come in and they're super interested in. So we do what we did with the cholesterol, right? We already have a model for this, where we take starved flies, we feed them these dietary supplements, and we started out just looking at the eggs and the, and the stem cell development. Now we look at all of the different stages of development of the fruit fly. And again, the genetics of the fly is really handy because we can do this in normal flies. We can also alter the, the signaling pathways that are important in cancer, the oncogene and tumor suppressor genes, and see if there are different or similar effects from specific dietary supplements in, in a, let's call it a tumor model. So these are pictures taken by the kids um, over the past three years, and so we can look at the eggs, um, and the phenotypes are very specifically linked because of hundreds of years, a hundred years of research in, um, in fly development. They're very specifically linked to individual cancer-related signaling pathways. Um, so we can look at um, the development of the eggs, these, these three. Uh, these are trachea fly lungs we can check out. These are intestines, so we're, we're currently this year working on a um, colorectal cancer model in the flies. Um, this is a behavioral assay, so some of the cancer signaling pathways actually alter the ability of the flies to be able to see ultraviolet light. And so we can determine what the effects of the dietary supplement are by counting how many flies recognize UV light versus, versus don't. Um, we can do neural development. Here's a, a beautiful um, developing eye where the neurons here, and the little red dots here, are projecting their neurons back onto the brain. So we have a lot of, um, a lot of tools. I have a confocal microscope in my main research lab that the students have access to. Um, so that's where we get most of these kind of fancy images. So in 2013, it was the first year we started this, we had an intrepid group of um, 16 students who came to just try it out for the first time. So the way we do this is the kids come in for um, 10 weeks to do experiments, and 11th week where they do an oral presentation, kind of like the one I'm doing right now, um, where the first five weeks they do basic training. So they learn all of the, the key um, 
tools that they need in the context of doing these nutrient screens. So they don't do anything that's not related to their project. It's not like we have skills and then separate that from, from their actual thing. We want them to have a real world um, lab experience where the nutrient screen is the reason that they have to learn how to pipette. They make all of the, their own solutions for the experiments they're gonna do. We don't hand them anything. Um, and so by the end of these five weeks, they're pretty, pretty competent scientists in the lab. And during that time, too, they also start to think about the results they get. So they design their own hypotheses based on whatever they get in the screen. So if, they're, if one of their nutrients they screen specifically affected a cancer signaling pathway, they focus on that. Some students are more interested in developmental differences between wild type and mutant flies. Full gamut, and we make no limitations whatsoever on, um, on what they do. So the first year, we did this proof of principle concept with the epidermal growth factor receptor. This is a very um, prominent pathway in breast, lung, and colorectal cancers, among, uh, among many others. Um, so huge efforts from the pharmaceutical industry have created chemicals that inhibit the activity of this epidermal growth factor receptor, which I'll show you in a couple of slides are, are drugs maybe some of you have heard of. So the first test we wanted to do is make sure this whole idea would actually work. We knew it worked for the cholesterol, um, but we weren't using cancer oncogenic pathways or, or trying to influence, um, we weren't tr really trying to influence signaling with external components um, of human diets. And so the first thing we did was we took one of these clinically available inhibitors, something that, that doctors use to treat cancer patients and, and fed it to the flies. And what we ended up getting was from from two of these breathing structures on the eggs, we ended up with one fused one, which is exactly the same phenotype as what you see if you lose the function of the epidermal growth factor receptor in a normal developmental genetics way. So this was really good. So this suggested that this was gonna work. And then we can look specifically at all of the those Rube Goldberg um, triggers that we saw before. So in, in um, green here, you can see that there are cells that light up with green. So that means that the epidermal growth factor pathway is actually functioning in those cells. And when we treat with this drug that turns it off, we really lose most of the green cells. If we now have a fly mutant that mimics what you would see in a breast cancer, so, so a mutant of the EGF receptor that just continuously signals without stopping, that drives proliferation, now you see that the drugs don't work anymore. So you have, um, you have the, in this case, it's red. So they're done by different students, so the colors switch, sorry. Um, you just keep up with me. So here's red, and then if you basically have the activated mutant, then some of the drugs that target the EGF receptor in uh, cancer patients don't actually work anymore. So this, oh, we can also measure specifically the amount of the um, activity of the signaling pathway. So then the next, that was the first year. The second year, this class came in and they got much more creative. Um, and what they did was each of the 16 students in that first round screened three of these dietary supplements. So just in one five-week period, we screened 48 different um, components of the diet. And then they looked to see whether they would see differences between normal flies and mutant flies with the hope that for, at least in a cancer situation, what you want to do is find a dietary supplement that destroys the mutant but doesn't really have that big of an effect on the wild type. Because when you have a chemotherapy, you want your wild type cells to be healthy and your tumor to be destroyed. And then we used all of these different phenotypes um, to actually characterize this. So these were the dietary supplements that scored that first year, the ones that actually had a dramatic effect on the flies. And um, four of them, selenium, vitamin E, hops, and curcumin, all gave that phenotype that made it look like it was something to do with the epidermal growth factor receptor. So today I'm just going to focus on selenomethionine. We're actually working on all of these pathways. Um, we've made the most progress on this. So what we see, which was a surprise, so what we expected was that the, um, the nutrient would actually prevent the signaling pathway. That's what we want, right? We have too much signaling, we want to prevent that. And what we saw was the opposite. So I turned down the signal a lot here. The purple cells now are the ones that have the EGF receptor working. You can see a couple of them here. 
Um, but very low doses of selena, selenium make the pathway activated, which is mimicking a cancer phenotype, not inhibiting a cancer phenotype. We, when you do medium levels, it's even more, and now it's in cells that never normally have activity of that pathway. And then at, when you get high doses, it kind of comes back down, which makes you think about that curve for the dietary recommendations. So there's an upper limit, there's a lower limit, and there's the ideal, um, sort of the ideal amount. So what we did next was we tried to map which of the components of that Rube Goldberg machine, which one of the signals was actually the one that's being targeted by this selenium. And what we found um, was that this RAS protein, which is mutated in 60% of all human cancers, um, this RAS protein seems to be specifically targeted by, by this compound. So the first student who did this um, just compared the, the amount of development of these pupil cases, so it's sort of like a cocoon for a butterfly, chrysalis. Um, and what she noticed was in the, the RAS mutants treated with the same drug, there was nothing there, so nothing happened. All of the, all of the developing stages of the fly were destroyed by, by this combination. And she could quantify that, so, so basically you see uh, you know, a pretty healthy um, response for survival. Um, without any drug, and these mutants were very, very highly specific to selenium. What's super interesting about this from a, a signaling person like me perspective is that if you go one step further down the pathway, there's no effect at all. So this really strongly suggests that this RAS protein, that's one, one of the most important proteins in cancer that also has exactly zero um, clinically available drugs to target it, is the one that's really being affected. So that's where we kind of are on that project right now. In two weeks, um, this is Chris Eichel. He works at a Title I school in Philadelphia where 72% of the students are below the poverty line. Um, he came and took our course. This is our, our mobile lab, our Foot Locker program. And um, for the past two years, he's been figuring out how to make this work in a classroom. So these are his students doing, these are the stereo microscopes that are included in the Foot Locker. Um, they're making their own solutions, they're learning how to pipette, and now they're ready to actually take all of the rest of those components of this signaling pathway as well as additional ones that we're guessing might be important, and the students in the classroom are actually going to tell us which of, these, um, which of these molecules is the most important thing for, for targeting for selenium. So what does this have to do with cancer? Um, we had students come back in the summer. So one of the important things about our program is the students keep coming back. Um, so we took different colorectal cancer cell lines that have different um, versions of RAS. So we have normal RAS, normal RAS, and mutant RAS, um, and then a, other proteins that are also different. And we looked to see if selenium would specifically affect the ones with RAS, but not the other defects. And that's pretty much exactly what we saw. So this is the one that has the activated version of RAS, and you can see by this um, activity assay of the pathway that it increases depending on how much selenium, selenium you actually add to the cells, where the other cells that don't have the RAS mutation are either not affected or are pretty variably affected. And so this sort of suggests, just like with the cholesterol and the pancreatic cancer, that um, identifying how these specific nutrients work may be really quite important for modifying um, the therapy that patients are taking in order to better enhance their, their um, chemotherapy. So this is the, the pathway I said I was going to show you. So, so in, purple, <laughs> in purple are all the drugs that have been generated to try to target this pathway because it's so important in cancer. Um, so what we find is that any of the drugs in this purple box here, 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 or here will be bypassed by addition of selenium, too much selenium in the diet. And so if it starts to work at this level of the pathway or down, then what you would want if you had high selenium is one of the drugs that work further um, downstream. And so what we really want to understand is how each component of the diet influences specific protein activity so that the, um, that the patient's regimen for chemotherapy can be very specifically targeted. You can get, I, I can put this up for you guys if you need the slides later. Okay, so, so what about other 
other things. So one of the things we know is that um, people read online, like, this dietary supplement is really good for preventing cancer, or I have this specific type of cancer, and I read online that this dietary supplement will work better than chemotherapy. And so the general um, mantra in, in the public is really that more is better. Like, if someone tells you curcumin is healthy for you, you're going to eat tons of it. My mother-in-law eats so much curcumin, she's, like, turning orange. Um, and and she knows me. <laughs> like, don't do that. Um, so then other people say it's natural. It's been used for centuries, like the licorice kind of idea. Um, and this is the most important one. If it wasn't safe, the government wouldn't allow it. And so one thing everybody really needs to know about dietary supplements is they are not regulated by the FDA at all. So whatever is in that pill, no governmental agency has checked to make sure it's good for you, bad for you, or even that it is what it says on the bottle. The doses are um, decided by whoever wants to sell it. And so this is actually a quite dangerous situation. So I already mentioned curcumin. This is one that a lot of people take. I'm going to focus for the last bit of the talk on this lay trial amygdalin. Um, and then green tea. So far, the, the hype about green tea is actually um, true so far in the flies. So what, what we see about green tea is that it seems to quite specifically affect cancer pathways um, and doesn't really affect normal cells at all. And this is not to say go out and start drinking a lot of green tea back to here. It's not that more is better. Um, but we're going to try to understand how the specific chemicals inside the green tea influence specific signaling pathways so that, um, so that we can really understand it. So I'm going to focus on this uh, amygdalin. So amygdalin is found in the seeds of apricot, so not the pit, but inside the pit. You have to crack open the pit and get the seeds out. It has this chemical. Um, that's composed of two sugar molecules, two regular sugar molecules like your body always um, eats, a cyanide, which is a very potent poison, um, and a benzaldehyde ring. And so the idea behind this um, is that tumors, which really, really, really like sugar, so this is a PET scan. Uh, a PET scan is an, uh, a test, a clinical test, where the patient eats a, a radio-labeled sugar and then gets scanned. So... So organs that use a lot of sugar, like the heart, um, will light up from the PET scan because they use a lot of sugar. And then the, the dye, you know, you end up peeing it out later, so, so it appears in your bladder. And so what, what they do is because sugars, uh, sorry, tumors love sugar so much, as you can actually see here, this patient has a lung tumor um, that accumulates tons and tons of this sugar. So the idea behind this amygdalin is that it has two molecules of sugar, which the tumors are super craving. And when it gets into cells, there's an enzyme called beta-glucosidase that chops the sugars off. So now the tumor is happy, I have sugar, it's what I want. And then it doesn't know it got tricked because it has a molecule of cyanide, which is poison, and a molecule of benzaldehyde, which is poison. Oh, sorry, I, I made it so nice here, and I just did it before. Okay, so you end up with your two sugars here, your benzaldehyde and your cyanide. And so the, the concept is like a Trojan horse, right? You have this army inside the horse, and then it gets led out, and then it destroys the, um, the fortress from the inside. And so this is the idea behind this um, idea. So does anybody know who this is? Steve McQueen. I showed this to the grad students, the postdoc. Everybody's like, no, I never saw that guy before. So, so a key thing with this is that he smoked a lot, right? So he developed lung cancer um, in the early 80s, right when the United States banned the use of this compound from the country. So banned, not allowed to be in the country, because patients who were being treated with it were dying of cyanide poisoning. So their lungs were arresting, they were getting severe neurological um, symptoms and, and heart attacks that killed them. So, so the use of this clinically was... was illegal in 1982, right around when Steve McQueen got um, lung cancer. So he went to Mexico and got treated with this stuff and died there. So nobody actually knows whether he died from cyanide poisoning or from his disease, which I think was probably quite advanced by the time he went. But he, is sort of, um, he sort of has now this legacy that this stuff can actually work for you if you get it early enough and start using it early enough. So what's happening now is there's this huge resurgence where um, 
where I think you can probably see in newspapers and things that, that there's secret cures to cancer, but the pharmaceutical industry doesn't want us to have them uh, because they won't make any money. And let me assure you, as someone who spends a lot of time working on cancer and has lost loved ones from cancer, if I knew there was a cure, it would not be hidden. Um, so this is something that I think is bred by, by desperation of the public to try to, to try to figure out what we can do. Um, what's dangerous about this is it, it may actually be something that harms people more than, more than helps them. So there's even little recipe books that you can buy from Amazon, the little cyanide cookbook, where people say this is God's answer to, to cancer, um, and don't let the scientists tell you that cyanide is, is bad for you. So this student, Steve, came to the class this year having, um, his mom was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer when he was 12. He's now 17, and he said, I need to understand how these things work because my mom is taking this stuff. And so we said, oh my God, it's cyanide. You can't work on cyanide, you're a minor. <laughs> um, and we need federal approval to be able to work on cyanide in the lab. But instead of telling him, this is dangerous, go home and tell her don't do this, which is exactly what the clinicians do, and so then the patients don't tell them they're taking it, we decided to test whether there's any truth to this at all. Um, so if, if it's possible that this can work as a Trojan horse for tumors, then you would expect that tumors and organs that light up in a PET scan, so the ones that are really craving sugar, will have really high levels of this beta-glucosidase, the, the thing that chops this thing and um, makes it poisonous. The second thing is that what we would expect is that if you create a pseudo fly that's like a tumor where you have activation of these pathways that cause cancer in people, then those should have high levels of beta-glucosidase, more than your normal intestine, um, where this stuff could kill you. Um, and then, finally, the flies bearing the mutations in the genes that cause cancer will be sensitive to killing by cyanide or benzaldehyde. And again, we weren't, we're not allowed to, um, to test cyanide in the lab, and you know, it can actually arrest your lungs as a gas, so, so we didn't go there, but we, we did some experiments with this, um, with this benzaldehyde. And so the answer right now is that we don't know, but there's something, something interesting happening. So what we did was we measured how much beta-glucosidase expression there was in flies that were wild types, so that's designated as one, um, and then all of these different mutants. So BRCA2 is very common in breast cancer. This is a colorectal cancer gene. This is not that well understood. This is another breast cancer gene. This is a component of the hedgehog pathway, so pancreatic, prostate, uh, brain cancer, skin cancer, and this is the EGF receptor. And then there's this P53, which is mutated in something like 88% of all cancers. And so we looked to see if the beta-glucosidase levels were different. Um, and a little bit scary is that many of the genes that cause cancer, the beta-glucosidase levels are actually lower, meaning that this um, late trial, amygdalin compound, will target normal cells before they ever get to the tumor. And so that's not good. Um, so the thing that's potentially interesting is that the hedgehog pathway that I talked to you about before seems to have almost double the amount of this beta-glucosidase. And so something that Stephen won't be able to finish, but we're going to follow up going forward, is whether there is something interesting about this in terms of hedgehog signaling, which I'll get to on the next slide. And so the other thing we did was we tried to see whether these same mutants um, were more affected by benzaldehyde than the wild type. And so the wild type, if you look when we counted at day four, whether the flies were alive or dead in response to benzaldehyde, this looks pretty awesome. So, so the wild type and some of the other mutants that have low levels of beta-glucosidase, um, nothing happened to them. But in the hedgehog mutant in blue, and the EGF receptor mutant in pink, we seem to be seeing a much more rapid killing rate in the flies than, than versus wild type. And here's the scary part, right? We get to day nine, and here's the wild type. Most of the flies died. What's even more scary is that some of the cancer pathways are still surviving perfectly happy. And so, so if people are taking this without knowing specifically what what is driving their cancer or what might drive their cancer, what their family history is, these sorts of things. And this is something that is our main goal to understand, is that they may be actually worsening um, potential cancer development instead of helping it. And we, I don't have the answer to most of this stuff yet, but um, with my new army, we're going to get there. So that's the idea, that an army of teens can uncover all of this really important cancer-relevant biology, like the 
the EGF receptor story I told you, and there's no way we're ever going to, it's banned, it's illegal in the United States to, to use latrile and amygdalin um, for treatment. But what if we could do something quite similar? So let's say we have those two glucose molecules um, to target this, the, the drug to the tumor, so that the tumor really wants those, those sugars. You have a linker and then you have a warhead that's something that's much more safe to use in humans that we know is clinically available. Then what you end up with is the same kind of idea, this Trojan horse idea, but without the cyanide poisoning that can, can actually kill people for, for other reasons. And um, pharmaceutical companies are really actively now trying to figure out what tumor targeting molecules are and what warheads are going to be safe and most effective um, for treating cancers. So we're kind of hoping that this late trial amygdalin thing that was started by a kid whose mother was diagnosed with cancer when he was 12 um, has been so influenced by this that he decided to, to try to figure this out. And he'll be presenting this talk next week probably in a much more emotional way <laughs> with his mom in the audience. Um, so this is the program. It's called Immersion Science. We have various websites. One of the websites is run by the students themselves. And so they describe the people who run it. And yeah, interesting, anyway, um, to read a description of yourself written by the students. <laughs> um, it's kind of fun. And so these are the people that contributed to the work I showed you today. And again, there are many, many more. We're, we're in the hundreds now of students who have participated, but these are the the high school students that did the work that I showed you. This is Stephen who, um, who started the amygdalin stuff. And then these are our uh, six of our teachers. One, two, yeah, six of our teachers. Um, five of them are at work in Philly Public Schools. And um, the Chris, who's up here, he's the one whose full school is now integrated with the program. And these guys are, are start just starting where he started two years ago, um, starting this year. That's it. I'll be happy to take any questions. Oh, I also brought, um, I brought flies and magnifying glasses and ovaries for you guys to look at if you want. I'll just pass them around. Okay, I'm listening. Okay, um, as a dietitian, I was, uh, <laughs> and, and also recognizing the utility of Thanks. using flies as a model, yeah. um, I, I had to say I was stuck. I'm stuck on that cholesterol question and the eggs and eggs are good okay. and bad because of because <laughs> I was trying to make a point. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Um, and you know, as uh, eggs have come and uh, ebbed and flowed. Right. As they're far coming back into yes. And, and I right. guess my I guess the question I have is is as regards cholesterol, is the fly a good model? Because of course. If you eat less cholesterol, we do produce cholesterol, and we'll actually yes. produce more cholesterol right. if we don't have no, it No, the, the fly is not at all a good model for cholesterol-mediated heart disease, not at all. So um, flies don't have most of the components that mediate that whole process. What we're interested in is that nobody has ever really, people think about cholesterol as accumulating, right, and vessels you know, inhibiting all of these different things, causing heart attacks, that kind of stuff. Nobody has really thought about it as a signal transduction molecule, like something that actually initiates signal transduction pathways. So we have a collaborator at Temple who's very interested in um, inflammation-induced uh, plaque formation in blood vessels. And so he's going to check whether the hedgehog mutant mice actually um, get increased plaques depending on their diet. So um, one of the things we're doing with the pancreatic cancer model is that we're feeding the mice different levels of cholesterol in their diet and looking to see whether the, the tumors develop earlier or later, whether um, this is something that can be used as prevention. So the answer to whether the flies specifically are a good model for that, they're not, they're absolutely not. But is that signal transduction pathway important in that disease? Um, that's one of the things we're trying to do. Would, would that depend on whether the origin is you know, ex, you know, diet or endogenous cholesterol. Yeah, so there's, there's these, um, these diseases called Smith, Smith-Lemley-Opitz syndrome. That's, um, that's where the, the patients fail to process cholesterol or process too, too much cholesterol. I, I, I'm forgetting, right? This is Tiff's work more. Um, so, so those 
those patients have very, very, very similar brain defects to the hedgehog mutants. And so we think that these things are linked based on phenotypes that genetically inherited diseases indicate, but we actually just don't know. So, so this is stuff that, you know, we, we only published the cholesterol stuff a couple years ago, so we're just starting into the mammalian stuff now, and we need, you know, I'm not going to do that, so we, we need to get other people um, to work on it. Oh, so the, the vials with the plugs in them, with the tape on them, they have little, um, little words on the front. So each one of those vials has flies that express one of these um, cancer-causing oncogenes in them. Um, so I just wanted you to see how big they are. So we're dissecting out the ovaries, which are in the teeny little tubes. So if you look in there, you can try really hard to see. There's two fly ovaries inside those teeny little tubes. Um, I just wanted you to get an idea of what you know, what we sort of do in the lab. And if anyone wants to come and do it, we'd love to have the public come and try out the stuff. It's in Philadelphia. There's cheap tickets on Frontier. Yeah. Did, <laughs> I think the guy... Did you say we'll that... We'll get to um, everybody. Yep. Did you say that you were going to um, tell us a little bit more about the green tea side, or was that... Oh, I can tell you more about the green tea side. So this, this is something that's a little bit more green in terms of our scientific progress. So we tried, um, it's called EGCG, is the main active ingredient of green tea. And so when we feed flies with mutations in the EGF receptor, RAS, um, the hedgehog pathway, or the wingless pathway, which is important in colorectal cancer, it seems to very specifically kill the flies that have the cancer-causing mutations. And so we, this is many pathways, right? The, the selenomethionine seems to be quite specific for just for the RAS pathway. So this is many pathways. So we thought, okay, well, maybe it's a, a common factor that's downstream of all of those individual pathways that's being target, targeted by the, the green tea extract. And so um, this is it, it's sort of like super complicated, but, but there are enzymes that modify gene expression by altering these um, proteins that wrap the DNA uh, called histones, and what we find is that the EGCG is very specific in its changes in those histone modifications. And so this is something that we're, you know, th that's a biophysics project that we're working with another lab at, um, at Fox Chase to figure out which genes are altered and, and how, how it's affected. So, um, so right now it seems to be that the wild type cells are not affected by the green tea extract, but the cancer causing um, mutants are killed by it. So it's sort of like the ideal situation, right? And when you test it, do you, um, are you testing um, mega doses or small doses? Like we that? test mega doses. So we, we take the human dose and put it in that vial that you, that's getting passed around. So we take the human dose and put it in there, and then the flies either eat it or they don't. Uh, what's really quite remarkable is that there are very few... Th garlic, so far, is the only thing that kills them dead. So, um, and they're dead. Woo, dead. Yeah, quickly. So the students who choose garlic are never happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so we started in 2013. Um, our oldest students who started then were seniors in high school at the time. So they are seniors in college right now. Um, and the three of them, there were only three of them who were seniors. One is going to medical school, one is going to graduate school for engineering, and the third one is going to grad school but hasn't decided yet. He has a bit of a personality, um, so he's, he's a little arrogant. He's trying to decide which of his 19 choices he's going <laughs> to grace with his presence. Um, but yeah, all of our students, 100% of our students are science majors in college right now. We haven't gotten past college yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm amazingly impressed, and I, oh, I, I think you must have a sort of a brain that can separate the, the I don't want to say the, the scientific effort that you're doing in other fields with the teaching and the learning and the mentoring and the and inspiration of, of students. And I, I, I sort of wondering you as a person how, how you have done this and how you have managed to be inspiring 
to these young people. So I, I was telling Mark and Elaine before, um, the, the reason that I decided to do this was when I was a graduate student at Harvard Medical School, um, there was a program there called Project Success with the goal to take the very first underserved minority student from a Boston public school and get them all the way through to actually go to medical school at Harvard. So this was in the mid-late 90s and there had never been a Boston public school minority student who had attended Harvard Medical School in the 150 years of its existence. So I was shocked actually and horrified um, coming from a very diverse community myself near New York City. Um, so, so I took this student she was 16, total airhead, very irresponsible, like never really worked very hard. Um, and I had to actually have my graduate advisor who's mean, definitely mean. And I told him, you, you have to beat her up a little, like she's not, she's not getting it. Um, but don't make her cry. <laughs> so she came out with a shell-shocked face and said, I need to work a lot harder. And I said, all right, let's get to work. So she ended up coming in third in the state of Massachusetts Science Fair, which is quite competitive given all of the research institutions there that year. She went to Brown University and started a um, support group for Latina women with HIV. And from that, she got a, a national, there was only five given out each year, the Jack Somebody um, Fellowship. So she went to Case Western Medical School for free. And then she got a residency at CHOP in Philadelphia, which is the best um, pediatric residency program in the country. And now just in this last year, she's a fellow in Rhode Island, um, basically going back to, to be a role model for her own community. And so this is somebody who really, like if, I mean, I want to say I did something, but really my, <laughs> my grad school advisor kicked her really hard in the pants and, and she got her whole act together. She actually invited me to her medical school graduation saying nobody ever told me I could be something bigger. So I knew when I started my faculty job that this was going to be a huge, important thing to me. I thought it would be just education. And we figured out really quickly, like, why not just do real research with the kids? Like, they're, they're doing something anyway. So, so now I feel like it's actually completely integrated. Um, and I forgot to say, which is shameful of me, Dara Whalen here, she is a, a trained K-12 educator, she has a master's in education. She's also been a, a, professor, a college professor and a scientist. So she, we work together very closely. We have extremely complementary skills. So, so, you know, she is the one who makes it possible, say, for the classrooms to actually, to actually do this. So I, I think you really have to have a, a trained professional educator um, in addition to a scientist who's like, let's learn more. <laughs> yeah. I can repeat it for you if you can. Oh. Yes. Go yeah. ahead and shout. Yeah, so repeat it. <laughs> These were the exact two questions that she told me that we were going to be asked tonight. So, okay, so far, what, you guys are doing great. What does a healthy diet mean to me? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm really a developmental biologist, but I'll try. Okay, so a healthy diet to me, my, my cousin's here, so, um, and all of my family knows. <laughs> my whole family knows that I pretty much survive on chocolate, so, so I am not a good example for the healthy diet, but, but I am totally open-minded. Like now I'm making my kids eat two-thirds of their plate with the, I, I'm really trying very hard based on the recommendations from the government while being pretty agnostic that they mean anything. So, um, so yeah, so we're going to try really hard. And my kids are the ones who are doing that elementary program. So this year we did, uh, they go to a first uh, kindergarten through sixth grade school. So the first through sixth graders are doing a lesson on sugar where they, I bring in the balances from the lab and the weigh boats and sugar, and they weigh out the sugar, and then they put it into beakers with stir bars, and you would not even believe how psyched elementary students get from stir bar. Um, it's really awesome. They have to figure out like what makes it spin, and it takes them a little while. Well, it's a magnet. Okay, but why is it spinning? How does that work? And one kid always comes up with there's another magnet. It's really amazingly eye-opening for everything. So then they, they put the sugar into the water, and then we add um, blood, so red food coloring. We add blood to it. And so then the next thing we do is we use um, diabetes test strips 
to measure how much sugar is now in their blood after they've eaten a very high or low sugar diet. So they pick a healthy food, a junk food. And so what we're really trying to do is get little kids to understand what healthy is so they don't grow up to be me who likes brownies for breakfast. <laughs> Any other questions? There's one here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, where's cancer um, therapy? So, so one of the absolutely enormous, enormous breakthrough, you all should read about this, is this immunotherapy for cancer. This is enormous. So um, maybe five, six years ago, a guy named Jim Allison from Sloan Kettering um, Cancer Center in New York, he's now in Texas, um, he developed this method for actually tricking your immune system into killing tumors. And... Um, so it's working absolutely effectively. So he came to Fox Chase and gave a talk to the postdocs who invited him um, the day before the FDA approved this new drug for treatment of melanoma. And so melanoma is one of the most deadly cancers there is. And um, when you basically trick your immune system into recognizing the tumor as foreign, um, they got 25% cure of melanoma, and that's cure, it never came back. Because the difference between using the immune system and a drug is that the tumor can't figure out a way to evolve around the drug. The immune system, every time that tumor cell comes back, it will kill it, every time, just like you can't get the same cold twice, right? Um, so, so this is really an amazing advance, and now there are clinical trials for most other cancers using this immune therapy. So I think immune therapy for the next 10 years is gonna just explode completely. Um, the question is for, for us whether that's gonna work for all cancers, we don't know. Um, the way the immune therapy works now is that it's based on molecules that we know about. It's, it's not the ones I told you, but an example could be like the EGF receptor if it was a, a different version of it on the tumor. They're not using that. <laughs> um, so. So, you know, the, the question is going to be whether you can actually find something specific enough for each and every kind of cancer. And for things like ovarian cancer, um, there's no common mutation in that cancer at all. And so it's unclear how you would, right now, in the next few years, trick those ovarian cancers into being killed by the immune system. And so I think we need to continue making targeted therapies. Um, these immune therapies can be quite toxic depending on your tumor burden. So if you have a really monster tumor, uh, leukemia that's throughout your whole entire system and the immune system just starts killing it, it's, you know, it can be actually quite da dangerous for the patient. So, so we need, you know, we need like a lot, of, just like we need the army of kids, we need an army of ways um, to treat cancer. So what I think our thing is gonna specifically influence could actually be quite fast. So if we know that if you have high, medium high doses levels of selenomethionine if you're eating a lot of onions and a lot of potatoes while you're taking chemotherapy. If we just say don't eat those things, we need to lower your selenomethionine so that you don't counteract the effects of your, of your targeted therapy, then that could be a huge help right now for patients right now. Because one of the frustrations for researchers is that it takes so long <laughs> before anything you figure out actually hits the patient. And what we don't have to do with just changing diets is um, get FDA approval, you have to prove the drug doesn't hurt mice, you have to prove it doesn't hurt monkeys, like there's a whole level of, of um, process to make sure it's safe for humans before it goes in. So I think in terms of the next 10 years, I think the immune therapy is going to be the biggest thing that you hear about, and by the end of 10 years, we'll know a lot more about how effective it was, like whether cures are cures, forever cures, or, you know, what's going to happen. Um, and then in the meantime, we'll keep developing um, drugs to make medicine more personalized. So the, the tumors will come out of the patient, they'll be analyzed, there'll be you know, sets of genes or proteins that are specifically altered, and then not diet things, um, but drugs will be used to target those patients specifically to try to eliminate their tumors. I th that's what I think. <laughs> Do you have any published studies on PubMed at all about this? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, what the, I look for? all the cholesterol stuff, you can email me, I can send them, send you the PDFs if you want. Okay. Um, the cholesterol stuff is published in the Journal of Cell Biology, it's two different publications. The, um, we, the paper that we published so far from the high school program is a methods paper on the histones, um, that, that the, e, the EGCG related stuff, and curcumin is in there too. So that's just tiny, most people will not understand that paper or ever want to read it. Um, and we're working on the selenomethionine paper that I'm hoping will be a more general, um, a more general paper.
Yeah. I have, yeah, anybody who's coming tomorrow, I'll give a different talk on our real developmental biology. Stuff. And without starting a big debate, uh, the <laughs> FDA, don't they say that it's okay for little kids to take Oxycontin? I mean, obviously kids that have a disease, but to me, in my personal opinion, I don't care what the FDA says. Yeah, so that stuff, I'm not a clinician at all, so unless my kids have taken it, I don't know that much about, um, and my kids have taken nothing. I didn't even do the, um, did the, do they have lead poison? I refuse to make them draw their blood and <laughs> just find out that they don't have lead in it. Um, so that stuff, you'd have to ask a clinician. I don't, I don't have... I don't have the um, expertise to make really strong comments about that kind of stuff. I, I would be scared. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, in the interest of dietary uh, supplement, I think we should um, let Alana <laughs> go and have dinner uh, after this uh, <laughs> seminar. So let's all thank her one more time. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Come visit. <laughs> yep.